big buildings, it could start to fulfill uh, many other pressing needs, such as housing and, and all sorts of things that we could talk about. We are stuck with a legal document that is going to hinder those efforts. So your design team, whoever that may be, is going to, within those constraints, have to do something that is as good and accessible to the public, but I think other sites are going to have to satisfy that pressing need that you just identified. Regarding the, the, the pollutants, you're right, any construction site, it's going to be generating a lot of greenhouse gases and pollution just to do it. When So, you know, that's certainly true. Uh, one of the things that we really need to get busy doing, though, is, is pulling out the satellite view and looking at the overall growth of this city. And the reason I talk about the satellite view is that we have that that uh, saying, what is the saying? Well, this is where small town living meets urban amenities. A and small I, town with urban amenities. Yes. So well, I'm about to say something, and you're thinking, you're, you're, you may think that I'm about to advocate that this city should become a big city, and I'm not. I want that to be clear. However, this city is showing signs that its destiny is a bigger city than what we feel comfortable with right, right now. And I think that if we don't let ourselves use the toolbox that big cities have at their disposal, like premium transit and a lot of the other things that, that where they, how they solve mobility, I think it's gonna take us by surprise. And we're gonna realize we're big, but then we deprived ourselves of those big city solutions because we were afraid that if we were to deploy those tools, that we would have hastened becoming a big city. So I think that when we look at greenhouse gases, we have to get s serious about constructing a transit system that can already stand up to the population and help move the population that we have right now. We cannot expect the problems in, 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 in tailpipe emissions to be solved merely by road widening. It cannot be solved that way. So transit, uh, urban, forest, uh, urban forestry, uh, energy efficient buildings, and walkability. If you implement all four of those programs seriously like other cities have been able to do, you can begin to reduce your, your CO2 emissions drastically. Yes, Mina? Okay. There are a couple of questions. Uh, sure. You want to be a moderator, you choose who, who gets to ask. Um, I wanted to bring up sure. two things first, yes. and then we'll we'll go to you. Okay. One is uh, the bayfront, the very bayfront property, is actually subterranean uh, property. It was dredged and placed there. It is technically um, land that belongs to the state. The city has the right to use it. If the city uses it for anything other than government purposes, it reverts to the state. Uh, so there are significant limitations. The John Ringling Towers used to be waterfront property. People who haven't been here very long don't realize that. Uh, all the rest of the, the area has been created through fill. That's one of the reasons for this problem. Uh, and uh, it's going to drive a lot of decisions on what goes on. Now, your question? Okay. Um, the library, the Kelpie Library is right over Hold here. on just a moment. Okay. Um, and and it, it moved downtown. Mm -hmm. And everybody around it can go from every direction. It's great. I can ride my bike down Coconut to it. When it was over here, nobody on this side of the road could go. It's the water. And so everybody on this side, there's no radius of people that can come from this side. So everybody has to end up on 41. And all the pedestrians have to cross 41. So my point is, is that this is the only really big possibility for green space, and they want to fill it up with stuff that is not water related, not water dependent, and which has a lot of parking places, 
And it's very difficult to get to for most people because you have to cross 41. And there's no you know, good transportation system. Whereas if it was located on 10th Street, let's say where the industrial land is, there would be people in all different directions. They could go east or west when they get out of it. They could go north and south. And you could walk to it on pedestrian things and you could have a bus. So my point is, is I like how you show the waterfront and then the other. Because if you look at the economic analysis, a lot of times those, those cultural amenities would improve those neighborhoods and they would be better. But when you put it here and you're building high rises everywhere all over the place and there's no open space for them, and, and, it, and you start doubling the population and you subdivide it by the, by the open space, you get nothing. And this is a water dependent, water related community and we're just filling it up with stuff that would make the eastern part or, or you know, the other side of 41 much better. Yes. So um, that was the short answer. Right here. This was the alternative. When, when we drew these, we did not advocate for one or the other, but we just, we drew each one of them so that we could understand the financial implications. So this one showed all of the cultural buildings embedded in the city, as you've described. So it's a different philosophy from this one, in which the cultural facilities come out to the bayfront. So I think that we do have to step back before we start drawing the thing and decide, do we really want the symphony and those other, those other, you know, I've heard people talk about an aquarium, I've heard, you know, North coming across the bay. Do we want those large program buildings to land on the bayfront or do they actually properly, should they be located embedded in the city, in, in amongst the urban fabric served by transit and other things like you've, you've just discussed? So what you say is profound, and, and it's true. And I think that, that we can't neglect that level discussion. We can't, whoever is engaged, whoever is hired to do this work, cannot just leave the gates thinking that it's already decided that the symphony hall and the aquarium and other things are destined to be on this site. I think there's a larger planning discussion to have before that, so yes. What about uh, the need for a larger population before public transportation becomes a feasibility? I, I don't think so. I think that we underestimate the threshold at which transit becomes useful for people, the population. Um, it, you know, we're at this awkward stage of adolescence in Sarasota in which we're at densities that are too high to be convenient for automobile use, as evidenced by the crushing traffic that we're generation, generating, but a little bit too low to not be subsidized heavily if we do the premium transit. So it's a tough place to be as a city because we can't build the roads to solve the problem, yet we can't attract the federal dollars with the densities being as low as they are. So we have to ask ourselves, what is more likely that we can undo the density and scare away the population to get back to a density in which we can drive everywhere? Or do we go just a step further and get to a density that's transit supported? And that's, there's no easy answer to that question, but that's the stark choice that's put before Sarasota right now and other cities that are in a similar position. Uh, could you go back to the first map you sure. said there, which was showing uh, Hyatt, uh, Quay? Yeah, the, the, the first slide, the, the, the figure ground map? This one? Yeah, that's the area yes. we're, really, we're really looking at. And, and yes. a couple of uh, points, I'm going to identify myself. Sure. I'm a registered professional engineer, yes. and I'm also a registered professional surveyor and mapper. And I've lived in Sarasota since 1981, or 34 years. And, you know, watched the entire thing grow and been a part of it. And we did the surrounds back in the early 90s. And we're, the areas where you're looking at now are the same areas we were looking at then. And you look at the development in downtown 
that serves so at the present time. And you're looking at some of the stuff that we looked at and proposed there. I think what they're proposing with the plan for the area there is, you know, is very good. But I would also like to say that area is not affordable housing and it's never going to be affordable housing. And the second point, you know, I'd like to make is, you know, I have told the city of Sarasota, I don't know what your opinion on it is, but uh, they're building the high-rise buildings, but they're not building the high-rise buildings. If you look at the skyline of Sarasota County, it's flat. And if they're gonna put those buildings down at street level and, and create the traffic and stuff, they need to take the buildings up higher where they've got it's more expensive real estate and it also you mentioned it earlier that i look at a municipality like a corporation the dollars that be coming in got to equal the dollar going out and if you're and if you're looking at the overall plan then uh, you need to look at look at that also and you generate and in, in the downtown area in any city, you generate the income or tax dollars that are coming in or, or tax revenue by the height of the buildings. And, the, and that's the way you also keep the cost of those units down. Do you, do you have a specific question for Andrew? Well, I, 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 I don't have a specific question. I'm just, I thought we were looking at this to get input from the uh, people that are here. I'm, I'm just trying to give him a little of the history that's gone on previously. And uh, also, you know, the thinking of probably most of the people you're going to be working with on this plan. Well, just to let, just to remind you, I'm not. I'm just here as a volunteer tonight. I'm, I have no guarantee that I'll be even working on this plan. Okay. So, but I wanted to, to, to be involved. Oh, well, I hope that they'll have me. <laughs> the um, you you mentioned um, affordability. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about affordability, and if it's such a big topic, it probably needs hours and hours. But but just briefly. There are some things in our zoning code and our regulations that are making it impossible to deliver workforce housing. And as an example, I don't think people realize how much the code is a culprit to why there's not affordable housing in town. And there's a cognitive dissonance because there's an, a frustration and angst with density, yet density in many respects is the reason why we can't have the affordability. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a let's take an example. San Sara. Everybody know the project San Sara, which is across from Nancy's Barbecue. It's a new ten-story high-rise. So San Sara is in the DTC zoning district, downtown core, which has a maximum limit of 50 units to the acre. Sounds like a lot, right? It's actually not. When you when you look at what 50 units to the acre is. It's actually a very low density for a core of a medium-sized city. So what happens? The financial team of a project, not the architect's fault, the financial team insists that the architect maximize the envelope of, that the zoning allows. So 10 stories, X amount of coverage, etc., etc. They insist upon it. That's why buildings are always basically in a high growth area as large as the zoning allows. So they build the building and then they divide it amongst, they divide that square footage into the, great, the greatest number of units allowed by the zoning. So if it's a one acre lot, or half, let's say it's a half acre lot for argument's sake. Half acre times 50 units to the acre is 25 units. So 25 units in a 10 story building means that each floor is divided up into two gigantic apartments of 3,000 square feet each. And then the financial team, of course, insists that you sell it for the, at least the price of the construction. So you say 3,000 square foot unit times $400 a square foot leads to how much? $1.2 million. So if you, we were to stop fighting the density and actually allow the numbers to be set at a realistic economic level, 
it wouldn't immediately solve affordability. Of course it wouldn't. But you would actually have, there's developers that are lined up, ready to, to build smaller units for working families, for starting out singles, for empty nesters wanting to downsize, downsize, and they can't do it because the zoning does not allow it. And so there's many other, there's a whole list of 20 things we could talk about it all night. But if you were to start removing those obstacles, you wouldn't increase the size of the buildings at all. You would just allow all of those, those high rises to be divided up into smaller units. You need the microphone if you're going to have any input. How do you fix it? So, there are two documents that regulate growth in the city. Many people fixate upon the zoning code, but there's another document. It's called the Comprehensive Plan. The Comprehensive Plan has something in it called the Flume, Future Land Use Map. And in the Flume, there's blobs of color that have maximum densities. The, com the Comprehensive Plan is like the U.S. Constitution. It's really hard to change. The zoning code is easier to change than the comprehensive plan, which is the Constitution. So we can't ignore the comp plan and the zoning code. So first we have to modify the future land use map to allow for uses and mixed use and a greater amount of, of maximum densities permitted on those areas, on those districts. And then we have to allow the zoning code to have zoning districts that have the numbers that match the comprehensive plan. Okay. So we have two major problems in both documents right now. And until you fix those two things, you can't even begin to address the affordability or attainability problem that we have in the city. So I don't mean to be a doomsdayer because I like to fix problems, but I wanted to identify for you what I think are two obstacles. One other thing I'd oh. like well, well, I'm sorry, I've got another question over here. Just a moment. I'll get back to you, I promise. The end of the tents, we've got a bridge you pull them. Mr. Mendon? No, I pulled it. Uh, they're not being recorded, uh, and I've got a question over here. You're going to have to wait a minute. Thank you. Uh, along the uh, proposed project here is a seawall. What is your position on living shoreline, living seawall, tourism, and mangrove awareness, and that sort of thing, just off the seawall? I believe, and this is a personal belief, that, that a, an occasional hard edge is okay. But I think it should be the minority of the waterfront should, that should be a hard edge or a bulkhead or seawall. And I'm all for the softer living coastline edge. So that can take on many configurations. It can be a true mangrove fringe. It can be uh, a an, an not very elegant solution is riprap, you know, which is the boulders like this. And then other people have, other designers have, have really mimicked the original Florida ecosystem with emergent grasses that come up into a, a, a hardwood hammock. So there's many different ways that we can look to original Florida ecosystems at the water's edge and recreate that so that the once it's finished, whoever gets to design this, you would be fooled into thinking that this was not as Kathy described, which was a, a, a you know spoil a spoil uh, peninsula created by dredging, but rather something that had always been here and was part of the ecology. So I think we should also, like you said, examine how much hard edge versus soft edge we want. And Andrew, this question may be outside your, your expertise, but maybe you want to get a step. I'll admit it, but it is. Okay. This is a pretty large uh, set of acreage that we're going to be talking about. And I suspect that the cultural organization and the scientific uh, organizations, the museums, and other civic assets that are interested in building on that property are attracted mightily by the cost of the land, which is, for them, zero. That's a question of value here. If these institutions were forced to go into the city proper to acquire property for their facilities, 
when they continue to have the appetite that they're showing now when the land cost is zero? Mm -hmm. Perhaps not, but perhaps yes. I think that if we start to be a little bit more sophisticated in the way we look at urban land in Sarasota, we could perhaps have the best, have our cake and eat it too. What do, what do I mean specifically? Here, the, I've noticed that there's a tendency to look at a piece of land and think of it as one thing or another. So this piece of land is gonna become a, a grocery store, or this is gonna become an opera house, or this is gonna become whatever, apartment buildings. But great villages, towns, and cities don't operate that way. If you look at the way walkable, mature cities, how they design urban land, there's a strata of uses, often in the same building. So you may see a ground floor that has a cultural institution, upper floors have offices or apartments, and there's a, there's a vertical complexity that's completely absent from, from here. So I think that if we look at some of the urban land that's in the city and we, we make incentives or at least make the zoning so that you can actually have that sort of complexity in the building design, we could actually give some of that land for free and still have economic development around it to offset the cost. But I think that we're hindered by the mentality that these acres are for you and you own them. And that's how we've always thought about urban land in this town, and I think that that's something that we have to move beyond if we're going to tackle these challenges. But I do agree that if we don't start to think in, a, in that, that way, you're absolutely right that the removal of these lands as possible landing sites for those cultural institutions may threaten their reinvestment in the city. I think you're right about that. So. Uh, I'd like to second my neighbor's idea of uh, keeping the green space green. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, uh, what you've been mentioning about embedding these ins cultural institutions in other parts of the city. Uh, because I think that green spaces, particularly waterfront green space, is one of the most important things that a city can offer. And if it's all full of uh, parking, which probably is only going to be used at night anyway, which is going to be incredibly expensive to build if it's going to be burned up over and would probably flood it in any case eventually because of sea level rise. Um, I, and then the point of the accessibility to, to be able to get at these cult cultural institutions from all different directions instead of having